Please join me now as we read responsibly Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where is my help to come. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will make slumber and sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will watch over you in the morning and the morning from this time forth and forevermore. Some sermons are difficult to write, and for a variety of reasons. Maybe the biblical passage is not easily understood, or maybe it's too well known and it's hard to find something original to say. Maybe there's just not much time left over for sermon preparation because of all the, the other demands on the pastor's time that particular week. Or maybe the pastor's perhaps feeling a little short on inspiration, creativity at the moment. And then there are sermons that virtually write themselves. This past week was one of those times. Now, it didn't start out that way, however. Earlier this past week, I wasn't even too sure about which of the lessons I was going to preach on. And then came Thursday. It began, as all my Thursdays now do, with my weekly volunteering over at Open Door. But then after lunch, I sat down with Cheryl and Susie Coulter to meet with Nate Hoffman, our representative from Brotherhood Mutual, because it's that time again. In other words, time to renew our insurance policy here at Hope. And so for the next hour and a half or so, he proceeded to walk us through all the areas and levels of protective coverage for giving helpful examples along the way. For instance, it was reassuring to hear that we even have coverage in the event of something like the, in the event that something like the coronavirus shuts down Hope Christian School temporarily or forces the cancellation of our worship services. <laughs> Good to know, right? Well, from there, I immediately went back to my office and logged on to my computer, where I had received an email offer from Norton, the company that provides the antivirus software that I use, advertising one of their other products called LifeLock, which provides identity theft protection. After that, I then saw an email providing me with links to a, a couple of resources from the ELCA. First, a, a congregational planning checklist for a pandemic and a second one entitled Worship in Times of Public Health Concern. Not too long afterwards, there was a second email from Norton Security, again about their LifeLock product, warning about how cyber criminals are apparently now using our concerns about the coronavirus to launch phishing attacks, that is, phishing spelled with a PH, in order to capture our personal information and data. And this was followed up by an email from Central State Hospital, with a helpful checklist for protecting yourself and others from infectious diseases, including revolutionary concepts like, gee whiz, washing your hands, and staying home from work or school if you're sick. Cutting edge stuff, right? Realizing that I needed to get back to work, I first, however, took a moment to begin exploring some possible YouTube videos for next week's contemporary service, and believe it or not, the very first video I chose to preview, the very first one, mind you, was preceded by a commercial from a company called Simply Safe, which provides a whole range of home security products designed to protect us and our loved ones from death and home invasion. In other words, in the span of, of just a couple of hours, in a single afternoon, I was made aware or reminded of our insurance protections here at church, antivirus protections on my computer, personal identity theft protection, basic practices to protect my health at home and here at church, and the whole range of products that I can purchase in order to protect my home and family in the event of unwanted intruders. Well, at this point, I really needed to get back to work on this week's sermon, so I opened up my Bible to the psalm assigned for today, Psalm 121, and began to read, I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? And bingo, there it was. And from that point on, this sermon virtually wrote itself. Think about it. Where is my hour help to come? Another way to put it is this. Where is my protection to come? 
Is it from insurance policies, computer software, personal planning and healthy habits, or sophisticated home alarm systems? Or is it perhaps from our government, the police, or the military? Or does our protection, our ultimate protection, come from somewhere or someone else? Now listen carefully to what I'm about to say here. I'm not saying that having insurance or following proper hygiene and providing for sanitary conditions or protecting your computer, your home, or your identity from real or virtual theft are not good things, even necessary things, because they certainly are without a doubt. So don't misunderstand me. But all of these protections and precautions, as good and as necessary and as helpful as they are, cannot, in the end, protect us from every serious or possible threat we may face, and almost certainly will encounter at some point as we journey through this life. In other words, as good as they are, they cannot protect us completely. So do we still employ them? Of course we do. But do we put our full and ultimate trust in them? No, absolutely not. You recognize the name John F. Parker? It's just as well if you don't. You see, John F. Parker was the name of the security guard assigned to protect President Abraham Lincoln on that fateful night of April 14, 1865, the night President and Mrs. Lincoln went to see a play at the Ford's Theater. Later, Parker insisted that the President had released him until the end of the play. Whether that was true or not, this much we do know, Parker apparently left his post during the intermission to go have a few drinks at a nearby tavern, and therefore wasn't on duty when John Wilkes Booth entered the President's box and assassinated Lincoln. Now, we certainly learned a lot during the ensuing years about protecting our presidents from danger and harm. However, in spite of all these advances in knowledge and practices and procedures, nearly 100 years later, in November of 1963, and despite being protected by an elite team of Secret Service agents who were on duty and on the job, and employing the most sophisticated techniques and tools available to them at the time, another assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was still able to take the life of President John F. Kennedy. The point here is simply this, no matter how much we do, or how hard we try, or as many precautions as we take, there is a limit to our ability to fully protect ourselves and others. That doesn't stop us from trying, though, especially in unusual ways. For example, police sharpshooters were once called to a scene in Rochester, New York, where they surrounded a car because someone had noticed that there was a man sitting in the back seat with a rifle. And at first the police tried to negotiate with them from a safe distance, but he wouldn't answer them. And so they watched and waited. And after a while they noticed that there was no movement by the man with the gun in the back seat. And so they carefully approached the car only to discover that the armed man in the back seat was actually a mannequin. When the authorities finally tracked down the owner of the car, he explained that because of the rash of recent carjackings, quote, it helps if it looks like you've got a passenger. In this case, of course, having an armed passenger for protection to boot. And yet again, there's absolutely nothing we can do to totally protect ourselves or to ensure our own safety or that of our loved ones. And so where then do we turn? When we've taken all the prudent and sensible steps that are available to us, where can we turn? From where is my help to come, asked the psalmist. And then he answered his own question with a confession of faith. My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Scholars tell us that Psalm 121 is from a, a collection of psalms, Psalms 120 through 134, that are so-called pilgrimage or journey psalms, which describe traveling to Jerusalem for the annual festivals that were held there. But over time, they also came to be used to describe God's presence and protection throughout all of life's journeys as well. And even though, according to Professor James Lindbergh, who taught at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, there are no references or even allusions to Psalm 121 in the entire New Testament, it nevertheless remains one of the more popular psalms in Christian liturgy, hymnody, and piety. As he points out, in the baptismal service of the old Evangelical Lutheran Church, as the child or adult was brought to the font, the pastor said, The Lord preserve thy coming in and going out from this time forth and forevermore. A paraphrase of Psalm 121, verse 8. And a clear reference to this idea of life as a journey. 
In addition to this very day, Psalm 121 is still often used to comfort the bereaved at the time of death, and then also during the funeral service itself, to remind us that God's protective presence is with us for the entire journey, all the way from our birth until our death. As Rolf Jacobson, who currently teaches Old Testament at Luther Seminary, notes, life is full of many dangers. The physical, disease, injury, accident, war, infirmity, or natural disasters, the economic, recession, depression, unemployment, outsourcing, downsizing, insolvency, death, and theft, the spiritual, doubt, sin, evil, corruption, extremism, or false teaching. And so what more natural question is there to ask, he observes, than from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And how does the Lord provide this help? First of all, the God who watches over and protects us neither slumbers nor sleeps, we heard. In other words, God is always on the clock. Secondly, God is watching over us day and night again on call 24-7. Thirdly, God will preserve us from all evil and keep our lives. Notice, however, that the psalm doesn't say that God will spare us from all evil. Rather, that God will preserve us from all evil. And fourthly, God will watch over our going out and our coming in now and forevermore. In other words, God is sort of like well, our body. In fact, all of these references to God keeping watch over us, six references in total, are all forms of the very same Hebrew word, shamar, which means all of the above, to keep watch, to guard, to protect. Psalm 121, therefore, is an assurance that God promises to be with us, to keep watch over us, and to preserve and protect us at every point and in every moment of this journey we call life. Years ago, I was working at Yellow Freight during some time off from seminary. I went to a game at the old Yankee Stadium with one of our company salesmen whose clients had begged off at the last minute. And I remember driving down from Middletown, New York, and my friend paying for parking in one of the stadium lots. And as we were exiting the car, a young teenager came up to my friend, however, and offered to watch the car for us. And so my friend tipped him a few dollars and we went on our way. And later I naively asked him, why did you pay that kid to watch your car after you had already paid to park in that secure lot instead of out in the street? And he answered, you don't understand, I didn't pay him to protect my car. I paid him so that he wouldn't go ahead and do something to damage it. God's protection, however, is no racket. It's more like the tradition followed by the early Native Americans who had a, a unique way of training young braves. On the night of a boy's 13th birthday, and after learning how to hunt, fish, scout, and survive in the wilderness, he was put to one final test. He was taken into a dense forest and left alone to spend the entire night all by himself. You see, until then, he had never been away from the security of his family and tribe. But on this night, he was blindfolded and taken several miles away, deep into the forest. And when he took off the blindfold, after he was alone, he was in the middle of the thick woods, unable to see anything around him. And every time a twig snapped, he imagined and visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. He was terrified. And after what seemed like an eternity, dawn finally broke, and the first rays of sunlight filtered down through the thick canopy above, and looking around, the boy saw flowers and trees and the outline of the path that had brought him there. And then, to his utter astonishment, he also saw the figure of a man standing quietly just a few feet away, armed with bow and arrow. It was his father, and he had been there all night long. In much the same way, our Heavenly Father says the psalm keeps constant watch over our lives, especially in our darkest and most frightening moments. In much the same way, God stands guard to protect and preserve us from all danger and harm. Today's psalm, indeed all of Scripture, reminds us over and over again that God is an ever-present fixture in our lives, a sure and constant help in times of trouble, no matter what those troubles may be. Our protector and champion, watching over us 24-7, and giving us the hope and assurance to face the toughest times that this journey we call life has to offer. In fact, as we heard in today's Gospel reading, this God actually loved us so much that he came in person to be with us. And God loved us so much that God was even willing to die for us and then rise again in order to utterly defeat sin, death, and evil, all the scary and terrifying things in this life once and for all. That's 
who God is. And that's what God does. Just as I was finishing up this sermon yesterday, I came across yet another email that I had received earlier in the day. And this one was about a church security training event coming to our area later this spring. In fact, Nate Hoffman, our insurance rep, mentioned it to us just the other day when he was here. Unfortunately, it's being held at the very same time as our Synod Assembly, and so I won't be able to attend. But it's intended as a practical, hands-on training event for church security teams to help protect your church, to help them make your congregation both welcoming and safe. Now, before you leave here this morning, I need to inform you that our ushers have already received from special, some specialized training that we are now prepared to put into practice. As you may have noticed, we have hand sanitizing dispensers placed strategic, strategically throughout the, the sanctuary. I've counted them, and there's nine altogether, including one back at the usher's desk. Well, as a response to the current situation, our ushers have been instructed on how to protect those hand sanitizers from overuse and theft. And so beware, they'll be watching you. <coughs> I'm just kidding, of course. Use all the hand sanitizer you need, but, but please leave them here for next Sunday. <laughs> and all kidding aside, remember that even the best protections and precautions that we can put into place are ultimately inadequate. That our only true health and protection comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 